So hello everybody and welcome to our second uh, Campuses That Care webinar. Uh, it's a joint endeavor between the OFL, uh, the Canadian Federation of Students Ontario and QP Ontario University Workers Coordinating Committee. I'm Janice Folk Dawson, my pronouns are she and her and I'm the Executive Vice President of the Ontario Federation of Labour. I'm really excited that you can be with us here tonight. Uh, my comrade Kayla Weiler and I, myself are emceeing tonight. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are coming together today from our homes in places all across Ontario. In honoring the ability to gather, we recognize the First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples who have inhabited and cared for this land for many millennium. I'm gonna turn it over to Kayla now. Kayla, are you there? There you are. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Kayla Weiler. Uh, my pronouns are she and her, and I'm the National Executive Representative for the Canadian Federation of Students Ontario. Before we move into our formal agenda, I'd like to review our equality and safe space statement. The Ontario Federation of Labour is committed to providing an inclusive, positive environment at all Federation activities and ensuring that all individuals are treated with respect and dignity. Union solidarity is based on the belief that people are equal and deserve respect. Words, actions, or conduct which is that are racist, sexist, homophobic, or transphobic divide us. Discrimination based on disability, age, religion, language, and ethnic origin also divides us. As trade unionists, mutual respect, cooperation, and acceptance are our goals. Behavior that embarrasses, hum humiliates, uh, excludes or intimidates, prevents us from working together and will not be tolerated nor condoned. Harassment is unwelcome. It is an unwelcome action by any person, whether it's verbal, psychological or physical uh, or on a single or repeated basis, which humiliates, insults or degrades. Bullying is unwanted conduct, comments, actions or gestures that affect a person's dignity, uh, psychological or physical health and well-being. Bullying may result from the actions of one individual towards another or from the behavior of a group. Uh, it is the abuse of perceived power that degrades, threatens, and or intimidates. Trade, unions, uh, trade union principles prohibit us from infringing on human rights of others and oblige us to unite together to protect rights uh, when others are attacked or victimized. The Ontario Federation of Labour does not condone or tolerate harassment, bullying, or discrimination, or any behaviour that creates an intimidating or hostile environment. All complaints will be investigated uh, through the resolution and complaint procedure. The OFL's policies and practices must reflect our collective commitment to equality. Um, our work must demonstrate that all persons deserve dignity, equality, and er, respect. Uh, now I'm going to hand it over to Chandra Lee Paul, OFL's Interim Director of Political Action and Outreach, to go through a few more technical aspects with you for tonight's session. Hi again, folks. Okay, so just a couple more things. I'm going to share my screen again. So tonight we're going to be moving folks into uh, breakout rooms um, a little later on in the session to do some action planning. And so in order to get into those breakout rooms, we need you to... Um, let us know which region you're in by uh, selecting your um, uh, option to rename yourself on your screen and putting the number of that room in front of your name. So there are uh, five breakout rooms tonight. Room number one is South Southwestern Ontario. Number two is Northern Ontario. Number three is Eastern Ontario. Number four is the Greater Toronto Area. And number five is Central Ontario. For folks that may have been in some of our previous sessions, um, our Building Power webinar or our Campuses That Care uh, number one, we had originally had Hamilton in the Greater Toronto area and we've now actually moved that to the Southwestern room as most of the labor councils and organizations they work with are generally in the South Southwestern area. So to be placed into that room, you need to, as I said, you need to let us know by changing your name to reflect the room number. So for instance, Rebecca is from Central Ontario, which is room number five. So Rebecca would change her screen name to say five dash Rebecca. And so to do that, you click on the participants button. And then in the participants button uh, list, you find yourself. If you hover over your name, the option to rename will pop up. 
you click on that and then there you can actually change your screen name. So not only can you, you know, add in the number and a dash in front of your name to let us know, this is also where you can uh, let us know what your pronouns are or an organization that you're with if there's enough room in the text to do so. So please go ahead and do that to make sure we know which room to put you in when it comes time to doing the breakout rooms. I also just want to give folks a better idea of what those regional rooms are, and sometimes it can be a little difficult to, you know, figure out is my is my city in this region or is that region. So, for instance, in South Southwestern Ontario, it covers Hamilton, London, Niagara, Kitchener, Waterloo, Sarnia, Chatham, Kent, Guelph, Windsor, those areas. Northern Ontario is a huge area. We've only listed a few cities, but Thunder Bay, North Bay, Sudbury, Sault Ste. Marie, Kenora, pretty much everything north of Perry Sound. Um, Eastern Ontario covers Ottawa, Kingston, Belleville, Peterborough, Cornwall. Greater Toronto is Toronto, York, Mississauga, Markham, Brampton, Oshawa, Ajax, Milton, and Vaughan. And then we have Central Ontario, which covers Barrie, Perry Sound, Owen Sound, Orangeville, Huron, Gray Bruce, and similar. So as we're going through this session tonight, if you could please make sure to take some time and put that number in front of your name. So when it comes out to the breakout room time, I can actually move you into the room that you should be going into to do that action planning and have those conversations. It would be greatly appreciated. Thanks very much and enjoy the rest of the session. Throwing it back to the MCs, thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee, and I can't encourage people enough. We have two presentations, a panel, uh, and then a, a great presentation from uh, Okow and John Odike. Uh, and it, the real meat of it is going, or the real, the main meal uh, is going to happen when we get into those breakout rooms. So I encourage you really, please go into those breakout rooms. Uh, we need to plan some actions around this. Um, so I'm going to get it started now because uh, we've got a lot of people on the line ready to get going, uh, and we're going to start with our panel and I get to the pleasure of introducing uh, Laura McClure uh, who is uh, with uh, QB Ontario University Workers uh, and she is the provincial health and safety rep uh, for yeah. university workers uh, and uh, she's going to get our panel discussion started tonight. So over to you Laura. And I got myself off mute right at the same time. I know. Excellent. So thank you very much, Janice. Um, and welcome, everyone. I'm sure that folks are zoomed out. But I have to say, the looking around at the room right now, uh, one of the benefits is I get to see a lot of faces that I don't get to see very often. So this is a real pleasure. Um, and it's also my pleasure um, to introduce you to our panel, who will talk about their experiences working and learning in, post, in the post-secondary sector during COVID-19. Um, first, I'd like to welcome international student, student Ankit Tripathi to share his story with us. Welcome, Ankit. Take it away. Thanks, Laura. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Ankit. My pronouns are he and him. As mentioned, I'm the international student representative here at CFS. I am also from Local 71 Trend Central Student Association, known to some of you uh, via QP 3908, that's Trent University. Um, and let's talk about international students, but let's let's not limit ourselves to the general discussion about lack of access to education or healthcare. Here today, right? I'm going to give you some. Uh, let, let's let's get some real quick assumptions out of the way. Yes, we don't have access to OHIP, and we do not have access to uh, OSAP either, right? In general things we don't have access to those. In the pandemic, uh, the international student experience has seen a lot of trade-offs, but most of them are for the worse. In general, what did international students do during this pandemic? We stayed the way that we were in a lot of the ways that aren't that great. And we continued providing support to the communities within which we're present. As international students, we don't often like to feel like we're being dependent on Canada as a country, Canadians as citizens and the system, but that often leads to the other side wherein we put in a lot of effort and still experience the same level of discrimination that is dealt to us on day in, during day-to-day -day actions. Um, me personally, for the longest time on our campus, I was a front desk staff at the Trent International Office. Folks that have uh, now taken over that position still continue to do that work, regardless of whether if it's from home supporting students that are trying to walk into these Zoom walk-ins 
or uh, redirecting students to uh, the supports they need. Alternatively, international students also happen to uh, take up a lot of space in supporting students in peer support groups, in students' unions advocating for things that we need, and also often as grad students as TAs in courses. But during this pandemic, our access to influencing how we view health and safety and what is the best version of health and safety for us is often you know, decided by other people. We're not allowed to be present in decision-making spaces because we're actively and systematically discriminating from participating in decision-making processes. The, the demand of international students during the pandemic has mostly been that of democratic inclusion and therefore greater democratic development on our campuses that actually allows people and students and workers to voice our opinions, our needs, regardless of our immigration status. Notice how a lot of in, uh, new international students that were supposed to be grad students and TAs aren't able to uh, you know, provide TA ship because they aren't in the country, therefore don't have a SIN number, therefore can't be employed. And that is an entire access to funding that they were initially promised and is now no longer provided. And that extends to for more things. A lot of international student positions that were on campuses have now been cut. So what does that mean for us? It means that the exploitation of international students' as capital, both labor and monetary, is increasing, but the services provided to us is, are decreasing. And as much as students can continue to organize and demand for what we need, I think it's always fantastic to have more labor partners working and advocating with us to keep this fight going because you folks have a very loud voice that sometimes really helps amplify some of our needs. Back to you, Laura. Thank you so much, Ankit. Um, so uh, now I'd like to introduce you to Amelia to talk about her experiences as a custodian at Queen's University. Welcome, Amelia. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Amelia, and as Laura says, I'm a custodian. Um, I am going to speak about how things run at Queen's and uh, how they've been running recently. Queen's is not uh, being consistent across the board amongst departments, uh, and we are also not being asked to participate in any decision making or any input. Um, we have a PPS, and then we have resident sides. They're not being run exactly. Um, as a, as a group. Um, so on the resident side, it's funny that in 2016, when I, uh, when we had a management uh, health and safety uh, meeting, um, we discussed setting up a pandemic room and we really honestly thought we'd never need it, but uh, later on we, we are using it. Um, so early in COVID management held frequent meetings to provide any COVID information. In doing so, the staff, the staff felt safe to come to work uh, up until September. And then because of uh, being slightly busy, then we just, uh, the meetings aren't as frequent. Uh, management provided members with PDAC training, uh, goggles, fog machine training. We also had uh, mask fitting uh, before, so they handed out medical questionnaires where, uh, to the members to fill out for a clinic to de determine if members could go ahead uh, with mask fittings. Anyone with underlying issues was, was denied testing. Uh, only members that had all the proper PPE and appropriate training are allowed to clean pandemic uh, buildings. We also, um, they held and organized key press locations to promote social distancing. Management also implemented an additional shift from two to 10 to provide the additional disinfecting in order to comply with the KFL and A guidelines. Uh, before COVID members had uh, access to PPE, cleaning and sanitizers in our storage area. And now everything has to be signed out. Even the pandemic room, we have a, a shortage of nitrile gloves. And uh, recently, we wanted to ensure that all the chemicals we were using um, complied with the SDS binder. Uh, and also students are not uh, the following rules and restrictions, making staff feel unsafe. Uh, the Dons also don't seem to be getting clear answers. And they say that it's hard because they're supposed to promote community. And in this case, this year, it's uh, going against what they've 
been told. And then you have the PPS side that are fighting for training. They're fighting for hand sanitizers at key presses or for even PPE. They um, have fought for clarification on new chemicals that were introduced just before COVID. Custodians feel chemical is less effective than the one being used previously. Communication from management uh, and, and university. PPS find that custodians have to question management on health and safety concerns that keep changing. And in late September, QP229 got Unity Council together and questioned the other unions if environment, health, and safety involved them in any of the safety planning due to COVID. After discussion uh, during a, uni a Unity Council meeting, all unions are in agreement that environmental health and safety leave us in the dark. The information is distributed to the university groups, but without previously discussing with joint health and safety committees. Committees are, are not consulted on implementation of protocols on health and safety, and the information is simply passed down to staff. Therefore, the right to participate is not being followed. As a group, we collectively took the university on to be included in their plans. The group contacted MOL on the chemical being used by PPS, which ended on a 50-50 win. Since then, joint health and safety have sent out some material to get feedback. I'm sorry, the environmental health joint and safety have sent out some material to get feedback from the committees, but we still feel that both uh, environmental joint health and safety and the university are extremely slow in their process of divulging information during these troubled times. We are aware that Queen's University is following the guidelines provided by government and local health, but we still feel that they are not reaching out for feedback from local unions before implementing any changes or procedures. And uh, so I just don't, it's quite, uh, it's quite disturbing that, you know, we're one unit, but yet PPS works one way and uh, residents works another. And we seem to be on the resident side to get more, um, more information, which makes us more confident to come to work. And uh, um, you have the PPS side that, um, aren't as lucky as us and it's just not understandable why that is so and that's everything I have that's amazing thank Amelia thank you so much um sadly I think that a lot of campuses are in the same boat but thank you for bringing that forward um so now I'd like to introduce Jade Dawson to talk about their experiences at Laurent as a Laurentian University grad student during COVID welcome Jade Hi, uh, thanks for having me tonight. My name is Jade. I use they, them pronouns. I'm the current president of the Laurentian University Graduate Student Association, and I'm a member of QP5011 as the Laurentian uh, GTA Union. Um, so in terms of graduate work, um, one of the key components for graduate students is having access to campus. And of course, with the onset of the pandemic, that was not possible for a very long time. Um, but in early uh, plans for how campus was set to reopen, graduate students did not have a place um, to voice any of their concerns that they made ha might have um, with access to labs um, starting to become available. So uh, I'll speak about my personal experience. Um, the lab facility that I work in is technically remote from Laurentian University. It's just across the street. Um, so all of the remote lab facilities like um, the Living with Lake Center where I work, uh, as well as uh, the Health Sciences North Research Institute, they each have their own separate COVID plans. Um, so this was uh, decided by the, uh, um, the Health and Safety Board for the Living with Lake Center, how uh, ours would operate. But I can't speak exactly to what this looks like at uh, main campus or any of the other uh, research facilities. So my lab reopened in July. It was uh, actually the pilot for how things were gonna go at Laurentian since it is remote. Um, so I've been working in the lab since July. Uh, I've also been doing field work as part of my studies um, uh, since July as well, um, except for during this last uh, lockdown period since um, timely I just finished my lab work um, but since uh, the lab opened, we saw um, very confusing um, 
you know, uh, the signs on the ground that tell you where to go. Um, it, it, the, the route plan just didn't make sense. There were dead ends for when you, if you were following the arrows where you just couldn't go anywhere. Um, as well, it's been encouraged that, um, well, it's mandatory that we have physical distancing, masks, uh, sanitizers are available at every bench, masks are provided for us. Um, and in some cases, lab equipment has been assigned to specific students. Um, so for field work, for example, uh, I signed out a PFD at the beginning of the year for on the water um, that had a specific number and that was my responsibility and didn't have to worry about um, anyone else using it to need extra cleaning or anything like that. Um, and prior to access the lab or um, doing any field work, uh, grad students and any staff that are going to be uh, on site have to fill out a COVID-19 questionnaire survey. Um, basically that survey that you have anytime that you're going to the doctor's office uh, or anything like that and had to be sent to our lab manager um, before you were granted any access to any of the, the buildings. Um, as well, the, at the beginning, research approval process was very stringent. Um, it was, it's been very hard to access campus at the beginning. Um, only very select research um, that are parts of like long-term uh, data sets or other things like that were allowed um, to occur. This has since eased up a little bit. Um, so um, work, uh, grad students that need to access the lab um, for completion of their studies are now able to access the lab, except for those that involve human participants. Um, and so far, we haven't had uh, any cases associated with this. Um, um, but at the beginning of the pandemic, um, in my lab group specifically, there, the custodial staff that was assigned to clean the building were not provided with masks from their employer. Um, so that meant that they had to use the lab supply uh, and the grad student supply that um, we have at the front desk for entry. Um, so like, we're happy that, that they could at least access through our supply, um, but that's serious negligence on the employer to have these workers coming in um, and cleaning facilities with people in them um, doing work without proper PPE. Um, in terms of the TA side of things, uh, most TA work is done virtually. All of my TA ships have been virtual since um, September. Um, and uh, some of the issues that we've, we've had around this are, are less to do with health and safety side of things, um, more to do with um, basic labor things like being paid on time. Um, graduate students at Laurentian University seen delays in GTA uh, payment despite working since September. Some people's first paychecks came in in November. Um, so that's almost th that's three months of rent that graduate students had to pay before seeing um, any kind of money from their employer. And, and we're still expected to work and, and show up uh, and carry on as essential workers to support um, quality education for the undergraduate students. Um, so that's kind of just in a nutshell what the graduate student experience has been like at, at Laurentian uh, since the onset of the pandemic. Thank you so much, Jay. Amazing. Just amazing. Um, so now I'd like to introduce Amy Conwell to talk about her experiences as an academic worker in the post-secondary se sector. Welcome, Amy. Thanks so much, Laura. Um, and hi, everybody. I'm really excited to be talking about this important topic um, and with such a fantastic panel. So as has been said, my name is Amy Conwell. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm an international-ish student and worker from the United States um, pursuing a PhD at the University of Toronto. I'm also a longtime member and the current chair of QP 3902. Um, QP 3902 represents some 11,500 contract academic workers at the University of Toronto and its associated colleges. And these workers include those who teach courses such as sessional lecturers and course instructors. It also, um, th these workers also include those who provide support for courses such as teaching assistants and exam invigilators um, and postdoctoral fellows working on research projects at the university and others. Um, we're the ones that do the bulk of the teaching work at the university with our membership actually exceeding that of the faculty association. And so I'm going to be speaking tonight about, you know, four key difficulties that this large and precarious group of workers faced and still face at the university during the pandemic. 
um, and I'll be focusing on the experiences of those who teach or help teach courses. Some of this I experienced firsthand as a teaching assistant for an in-person course that abruptly transitioned from in-person to online at the start of the pandemic. Um, and also later as a first time course instructor actually for an online course um, this summer. So the first big issue um, happened at the start of the pandemic and then continued throughout. So on March 16th, when the university shifted online for the first time, instructors and teaching assistants had to learn, implement and adapt to a new delivery model and a new teaching plan on the fly and with little support. So they were forced to balance in doing this, you know, their commitment to their students and their course topic and education in general and their investment in their course with the sudden challenge of finding new ways to present and deliver and teach their material with, again, no notice and very varied direction and support from department to department. In fact, the quality of the support offered really often came down to the approach of the individual who was leading the faculty or the department. There was no central direction from the university. Um, and additionally, they had to deal with unequal and unclear access to paid training to account for the added unexpected work that went into learning new platforms and ways of teaching. Um, I think that a key choice that instructors were asked to make at a later stage in the pandemic um, and in pandemic teaching actually illustrates this well. So in pre preparation for the summer semesters, um, there was this question, how are you going to teach your course? Are you going to deliver your course synchronously, asynchronously, or via a combination of both? So teaching a course synchronously means you're teaching it in real time. And in doing that, you're risking connection issues for your students and yourself, um, potential time zone conflicts for your students and caregiving conflicts, but you're allowing interaction and conversation, group activities and the development of a classroom community. So there's a reason to go for it. Um, if you choose asyn asynchronously, you are not teaching in real time. You're teaching instead via pre-recorded lectures um, and in so doing, you're risking really total disengagement with the course, but you're allowing greater access, of course, to the material and doing away with the issues that would come with the synchronous model. And if you do both, you know, then that seems to be potentially the best of both worlds for students, especially in that you get them both access and interaction, but it doubles an instructor's already intensified online workload. I ended up choosing this combined method for myself when I taught my summer course and I ultimately regretted it um, because it did demand that almost double workload than simply teaching the course synchronously or um, in real time would have. So that's issue number one, a big issue. Issue number two um, is related. It's that instructors and teaching assistants needed new expensive unbudgeted for gear to be able to perform their work and connect with their students. Um, and unfortunately, despite the fact that this need was obvious and across the board, um, for new equipment and new software, the university did not um, see a need for itself to create any kind of mechanism for academic workers to access the equipment that they now needed to do their work to teach. Um, if, you, if you might be wondering, you know, what kind of gear you might need to teach a course online, it could include things like um, a webcam and microphone so you could be visible and audible to your students, a room divider so you're not just teaching from your bedroom and possibly you know showing your bed to your students and then the bare necessities um, such as a device to teach from not all of our members had laptops at the start of the pandemic or internet to just simply connect to the teaching platform that you're using so we actually asked the university to work with us to take steps to improve these um, unsettled working conditions for these members included including by establishing a one-time only fund to help offset these expenses um, no one will be surprised to hear they just outright refused. Um, and instead, academic workers were just forced to pay out of pocket, essentially, sometimes finding um, reimbursement through other methods, through ad hoc emergency funds and grants um, that the university encouraged departments to set up for graduate students. But of course, this was only available to graduate students, so access to um, funds to offset expenses was um, varied and um, unfortunately not available to sessional lecturers and postdocs. Also members had to turn to grievances to get the university to pay for just basic expenses that they should have been paying for already to facilitate their teaching. So that was a huge issue. Moving on to three, honestly, it's really just a struggle to create a quality, accessible and safe learning environment online, especially when you're not familiar with teaching online and when you're making these transitions so rapidly. So I'm just gonna touch briefly on each one of those um, issues. So in terms of quality, 
it's really difficult for instructors and TAs to assess where students are at in terms of their comprehension of the course content when they can't read um, body language as they would in a classroom. And while it might seem like a viable solution perhaps to ask students to turn on their video, in doing that you um, encounter a whole host of other issues around privacy and safety for students. Um, and also the inevitability that only those students who would already have been comfortable participating in class turn their videos on. It doesn't really address the issue. In terms of accessibility, um, you know, a number of issues come up from time zone uh, to Wi-Fi strength. Um, for example, in my course, I had two sisters enrolled and they were sharing one laptop to connect to the course platform, which they were connecting to via a phone data plan because of their slow Wi-Fi. And unfortunately, just the tech difficulties of this um, led to them constantly being bounced out of the course. And unfortunately, one of them eventually had to drop. Finally, in terms of safety, you know, just like with any other online forum, you need to moderate an open chat. Um, and so this needs to be done by course instructors who are moderating for problematic content that students could be dropping into the chat. Um, and this additional duty is again, something that really interrupts the course and makes it difficult for instructors to smoothly um, lead discussion and, and teach their material. Finally, fourth issue, um, and a huge issue. U of T dragged its feet on the question of whether the summer semester, um, summer sessions and the fall semester and really the whole academic year, this 2021 academic year should be online. Um, so we, in coordination with the coalition of unions and other campus groups, um, we urgently called on the university to take this step to you know, listen to science, which predicted an obvious need for prolonged social distancing, take a leadership role in protecting their students and workers and the community from transmission, and to actually lead to a better quality of education that is an undisrupted learning experience for students by declaring the university online in advance. But instead, they just left us out of the conversation. They didn't include unions or joint health and safety committees in a meaningful way at all. Um, and relatedly, they left the choice to move a course online up to individual instructors and refused to move the entire university online until forced to do so by increased public health measures midway through the fall semester, which notably is, was after students had already moved into residence and after the drop deadline for courses. Seems like timing worth, you know, um, meditating on. And so this delay and the second disruption not only caused preventable uncertainty and anxiety and health and safety concerns, but also led to instructors again taking on extra work to prepare for multiple modes of possible course delivery or to transition back to um, from in person delivery to online. So to kind of sum all this up. Um, the university's misguided approach to health and safety during the pandemic and the misplaced burden they placed on individuals to make health and safety choices that they were not trained to make um, impacted the entire community and compounded the already difficult situation that contract academic workers were put in, in having to choose between their pedagogic commitments and their care for their students and the uncertainty of receiving extra pay for extra work, which really shows you how much the university actually cares about its students. Basically, like the bottom line of everything I'm, thing that I'm saying might be summarized as follows, you know, while contract academic workers were not and are not paid anymore with wages frozen or capped at 1% and the university not taking any measures to counter the increased workload from the pandemic, students are not paying any less. They're still paying full tuition fees, including fees to access gyms and services that they are not able to use and international fees at the University of Toronto are dealing with high tuition increases in excess of 4%. Meanwhile, the University of Toronto consistently beats its own fundraising goals and is in the midst of its most successful fundraising campaign ever. Thanks. Thank you, Amy. That's um, yeah, it's amazing. Um, so now I'd like to introduce OUWCC Vice Chair Kathleen Webster, who is going to share a story on behalf of a frontline worker who is a parent and what their experiences are like during working during COVID-19 in uh, the post-secondary sector. So take it away, Kathleen. Hey, good evening, folks. Um, and adores a uh, story tonight. And unfortunately, Anna couldn't be here um, herself to tell it herself. Um, but I believe once I uh, begin sharing, it'll become obvious why Anna couldn't fit us into her already incredibly busy schedule. 
Um, Anna felt, however, that it was very important to uh, share her story in the hopes that others don't feel as alone or isolated. But also there are some important questions to ask and lessons on what can be done, what should be done, and where and what we can learn from. So Anna's story starts with um, her immigrating to, uh, to Canada from Mexico when she was 18 with the goal of being able to sponsor her parents and that they would someday be able to join her here in Canada. Through a lot of hard work, and Anna emphasizes this, um, that uh, she was able to meet that goal. Her parents are now here um, and able to offer up some supports. She mentions this because it's important to note that while Anna does have access to some supports in difficult times, like a pandemic, these supports are also limited. English is a second language, and Anna, um, although uh, fluent and comfortable, um, cannot rely on her parents to help with the online learning portion uh, that her child um, needs. Um, Anna has an 11 year old son named Duchesne, um, who on a rate on a don't like using this term but on a normal basis would do in person uh, learning. Duchesne um, has some uh, special needs and um, some speech and language struggles. So on top of um, having to have Anna be present for the online portion of school. Um, there are multiple appointments that he needs to attend, um, both virtually and a few that are able to um, take place in person. So she's already um, juggling uh, a lot there. Anna herself um, is an undergrad at Brescia studying food and nutrition. Doing all of this while maintaining a full-time uh, career as a caretaker at the University of Western Ontario. Her job requires her to be physically on campus. Prior to, the COVID, to COVID, Anna's work schedule would require her to be on campus Monday to Friday, 6 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. This has since had to be adjusted. When we were in the beginning of the pandemic, Sorry. Uh, things were incredibly uncertain. Anna felt very nervous and insecure between the lack of communication and compliance with others who were also on campus. These concerns became more and more prevalent. Um, Anna is a frontline worker um, requiring uh, to be on campus. So like much of her colleagues, we were the first folks um, that had to do the um, screening before reporting to work. Um, we were present on campus before the communication started flowing. That had, as we evolved through and navigated this pandemic, that was one of the lessons learned was the fact that we had um, much better communication um, both with the unions and associations on campus and the employer, as well as those that were requiring to perform their duties online. As the communications began to flow, um, concerns and anxieties were eased. This continued on as we navigated through. A year later, we find ourselves with different stressors and different anxieties. Well, we were able to ease some of the concerns through um, practicing social distancing, better communication, and more involvement with the different universities, or sorry, unions and associations on campus. We're now facing uncertainty around family responsibilities and how our employers are going to handle the fact that we have folks that need to be in, um, required to do assist with their children's online school as well as their own as well as maintaining full-time hours um, to complete their their duties again 
with the lack of communication we didn't learn from the beginning of the pandemic a year later we still found ourselves having to repeat the question of how they would handle the family responsibility anna reached out to her union executive and through um, agreements made with the employer she was able to commit half of the hours uh, required in her 40 hour work week with the other half being um, paid through the employer. She no longer had to utilize the limited vacation that she was um, saving for her exams, future exams and studies. Anna is grateful for the opportunities that Western has provided her. However, she is very aware that these um, opportunities are limited and not afforded to um, everyone within the sector. Again, Anna's um, main uh, objective here was to share um, her story, knowing that there were many, many folks out there and that um, there is hope that if you reach out, um, that there are those out there that are willing to assist and help navigate through um, the, the challenging times. Um, but that was one of the things when I was talking to Anna and, and that she wanted to drive home was that folks weren't alone um, and that there were some lessons to be um, learned and some further uh, and a lot of questions on why um, why it took so long and why we didn't learn from the beginning of the pandemic. Um, it was obvious for a lot of um, Anna, uh, for her and her colleagues, that folks were stressed. Um, anxieties were high and it was because nobody was telling them anything. Um, and yet they were, were being asked to perform um, these duties in high risk situations. And um, I just wanted to, uh, thanks for allowing me to share Anna's story on her behalf tonight. Thanks, Kathleen. We're really glad that you were able to. Um, there seems to be some common themes running through all of the stories um, that we've heard or experiences that we've heard tonight. Um, so now I'd like to call on uh, QB National Health and Safety Specialist, Andy Chenier, to explain what would have happened in each of these situations if occupational health and safety was guiding the legislation. Uh, thank you, Laura. Uh, so my name is Andy. I use uh, she, her, pro or elle pronouns. I speak French. Je suis parfaitement um, bilingue. I had prepared a slideshow presentation. And after hearing all of the stories of uh, the students, I'm thinking I may just forget about that <laughs> and simply start um, discussing some of the common themes and some of the things that could have been implemented in the workplace to um, get around some of those issues. So uh, I heard a lot of stories of uh, discrimination in what was discussed by the different uh, stories or by the different panel members. I've heard it from Ankit. I heard it from uh, Kath Kathleen's retelling of Anna's story. Um, and it's a theme that's been a big problem, not just on campuses, but across uh, across the, the province on uh, during the pandemic, because access to supports are 100% going to be uh, dependent on what it is that you can physically or virtually get to. And when information is not flowing and information is not coming your way as to what some of the issues might be, it's really difficult to know where to reach out for that information. Some other themes that I heard, uh, we were talking about consistency and changing concerns and changing information and having um, you know, confusing signage, not having the proper uh, PPE, not having access, uh, not having accommodations. Those are all themes and all uh, things that we can absolutely address through the Joint Health and Safety Committee. And these are things that um, more often than not, the problem doesn't lie with whether or not uh, the Joint Health and Safety Committee is working. It has to do with whether or not the worker members 
who sit on that joint health and safety committee are aware of the power that they have. Because most employers like to tell you that the Joint Health and Safety Committee is their committee and that they're going to quote unquote, tell us what's happening. But the fact of the matter is, is that that is not the proper way to do joint health and safety because let's face it, joint health and safety. And here's why it matters that it actually be truly, truly joint. Employers are uh, aware of laws, regulations. They understand the policies and procedures that may be going on. They understand their budgets and all of the other things that I don't really care about. Um, but at the end of the day, they don't know the work. They understand the categories of work. They understand um, the different uh, job classes that they may have or the different uh, programs that they're offering, the different labs that exist online, on, on campus or online for that matter. But they don't know the work because there's not a single workplace that I know of that is exactly the same as another work as another workplace. There's no such thing because every single workplace that I've ever been to, that I've ever heard of, uh, they always have, you know, that that knob that sticks at one end, or uh, the fact that you know that when you open a particular or you use a particular piece of equipment, you need to bang it twice on the back end so that it works properly and or even just turns on. Those are the kinds of things that workers know. And some of the stories that I was hearing about confusing signage, um, not necessarily having dedicated equipment, not having proper screening, these are all things that tell me that an employer has sat down in their very, very nice office, but I'm sure it has a nice ergonomic chair um, and thought about, you know, general information that from that they've received from public health. And they've, you know, sat down and thought about, hey, what could I possibly be doing with this? The problem is that not bringing this information to the Joint Health and Safety Committee means that you wind up with um, I believe uh, Jay, when they were describing the way that they, you know, they would end up in a dead end uh, when following the actual signage that was put up by the employer. Those are problems. Those are huge problems. And those are the kinds of problems that you, you run into when the employer doesn't uh, engage the Joint Health and Safety Committee. So now, what does the Joint Health and Safety Committee uh, have to say or have to do with any of these things? So the job of the, uh, the Joint Health and Safety Committee is to take the information that the employer has presumably obtained from public health. And I think that at this point we all know, or we should know what the public health advice is, which is, you know, uh, two meters, not to six feet, two meters, because if you're imperial, you're within, uh, you're six inches uh, closer to a person who has got COVID. So two meters difference, you wanna be masked, you wanna be washing your hands, um, and you also want to limit the amount of contacts that you have. So that's the public health advice. So what does that look like in a university? Well, what that looks like is a base, a really good basis for a risk assessment. And health and safety is not that complicated. Uh, in fact, the health and safety system tends to be pretty much the same over and over and over again. Really, the only thing that changes uh, would be what hazard we're contemplating. And in the context of a COVID-19 pandemic, obviously COVID is the risk. So interesting things that uh, employers often have failed to do. They failed to respond to change in, uh, a change of information. And under law, an employer has an obligation to actually take all reasonable precautions for the protection of a worker. That's in the act, that's 252H. If you, if you know no other section of the Occupational Health and Safety Act, memorize, chant it, it's a great meditation. Uh, 252H, it, it, it's even easy to hum. Um, 252H, which says that the employer has an obligation to take all reasonable precautions for the safety of a worker. So what that tells me uh, is that when information changes and the employer becomes aware of new hazards, what are new hazards that the employer might have uh, become aware of? Well, just in the last three months, I can think of Public Health Association of Canada deciding or not, de well, deciding to acknowledge the science that said that aerosolized transmission is a thing. And you will hear uh, right after me, you'll hear from a fantastic uh, human being in general, uh, John Odeik, who's going to be providing you with some really good information on um, aerosolized, uh, um, uh, aerosolized countermeasures, including ventilation. So, uh, so when, so, so the 
PHAC changed the, their, their, or acknowledged that there was aerosolized transmission. But at the beginning of the pandemic, everybody was contact droplet because it's been demonstrated that it's contact droplet. I'd like to point out, I would love to see somebody actually demonstrate that transmission occurred by contact droplets. Because as far as I know, that has not been demonstrated. So when they say it must be contact droplet and not aerosolized, they don't have evidence one way or, well, they have more evidence for aerosolized transmission than they do for contact droplet. Um, then there's another, uh, another in instance where the employer might have reassessed or should have reassessed the risk is now you have wonders of the variants. So, so now you have the UK variant, you have the uh, South African, and you also have the Brazilian um, variants that are now in like a reality in Ontario. Uh, so now what you have to, uh, the employer should have been doing a risk reassessment. So where's the power of the Joint Health and Safety Committee in all of this? You have the power to ask for that information. Any worker in the, in, the, in the workplace has the right to ask for information and to be provided with a copy of that information if it deals with health and safety. And on top of that, the employer has an obligation to provide all of that information to the Joint Health and Safety Committee. So when I was hearing those themes of the employers not sharing, the employers not giving us the information that we need, this is where as, um, as a, a group of, of workers banding together, we can actually make a difference. We can demand that kind of information. So because information is not being provided, I'm gonna drop another, and I'll put those into the chat as well, but there's a section 25 L and a section 25 M, which obligates the employer to provide you with any report that has occupational health and safety as part of it. So 25 L, 25 m and once you make the employer aware that you are requesting this information a good tip is to do it in writing once you've done it in writing the employee if the employer fails to provide you with that information it's a super easy call to the ministry of labor's uh inspectors because at this point the employer is failing in their obligations very easy call 1-877-202-0008 and you call the Ministry of Labor, you can even do it online if you don't want to talk to someone. Uh, there is on the Ministry of Labor website, there is a, a area where you can uh, lodge a complaint online. Part of your risk assessments should also be including, do workers have access to PPE? Do they know how to use it? Because most of the time, if you've got PPE, and I've really loved the fact that the employers usually tell us if you're wearing PPE, you can't get infected, not true. Um, you just have a lower risk of getting infected. So that's a very important thing. But do workers have PPE? Are they trained on these things? Do they know how to put it on and take it off? Because if there's going to be a contamination event, that contamination event is gonna happen most likely when workers are taking off their PPE, not when they're putting them on and not when they're wearing it, unless they're wearing it inappropriately. So. Part of those, those activities, when you're asking the employer for information, when you're asking them to, uh, to give you the information that you need, if they're not meeting often enough, demand it, saying the information is con confusing, it's not appropriate, we need to have more information, we need to have more dialogue. And if the employer is not responding to those kinds of, uh, of requests, complain to the Ministry of Labor. If we make it about how the employer is not following the Occupational Health and Safety Act, we can have a lot of success. If we make it about whether or not COVID is scary and you're afraid to uh, get infected and potentially get sick, you're probably not gonna get into as much of a success uh, as you would by making it occupational health and safety uh, related for part of the act because inspectors really, really, really wanna know where did your employer fail? So make it clear to them they have failed here. They're not providing us with information. They are not engaging us. They are not, somebody said at some point that we're, our right to participate is being, uh, they're preventing us from participating in our own uh, health and safety. That is not acceptable and the Occupational Health and Safety Act does not permit that. Um, so, in, um, so in closing, I realize that we're going a bit late. Um, so in closing, what I really want to leave you uh, with is that your employer is not allowed to um, leave to to exclude you from your own health and safety. Um, 
And there are resources that you can access if you're looking for more information on how to use a Joint Health and Safety Committee or what kind of protections you may need in order to be able to apply um, protections or controls to uh, for COVID-19. And those can be found on the QP website, the QP.ca website. We have uh, an entire health and safety section and two particular sections, one on uh, COVID-19 work practices or working during a pandemic and another on how to use a joint health and safety committee. So on that, I will turn it back over to you, Laura. Thank you so much, Andy. That was excellent information. Um, and when you talked about um, the role of the joint health and safety, because we know the work and, and the employer knows legislation. I had a conversation as uh, I think most everybody is aware, we've had an outbreak at the Guelph campus. Um, and I had a conversation with the employer and said, we really need to learn from the mistakes that happened and we need to have a conversation. And he, he said to me, I thought it went really well. I was like, well, I guess you would if you weren't here. I'm sure it was, but he thought that the committee worked and everything was fine. So that just demonstrates where they're at as opposed to where we are at. So thank you so much to everybody for participating. That was excellent. Um, I'm gonna hand it off now to Kayla. Thank you. Um, yeah, and thank you everybody. That was, uh, that was great. <laughs> uh, now I'd like to introduce uh, to you, John Odyke, uh, who is an occupational uh, hygienist and an with the Occupational Health Clinics for Ontario Workers, uh, also known as OCAO. Uh, so John is uh, going to talk to, about, uh, talk to us about uh, ventilation in post-secondary institutions. Uh, thank you, John. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yes, we can. Uh, sorry about that. Um, yeah, I didn't know what the title was for tonight, but <laughs> it's a little different than it was announced. But um, we're talking about things in the air and how to get rid of them. So uh, we know a lot about uh, transmissible diseases like colds and flus and things like that, but COVID is uh, quite a bit different. Uh, that's probably an understatement, but most cases uh, don't spread to more than one or two people, if any at all. However, there's a small minority of cases that spread to a lot of people. Sometimes these are called uh, super spreaders, but there are actually super spreader events. Uh, it's not just the person, it's the person in the environment that they're in, the time trend of the disease at the time that the uh, the uh, contagion happens. And uh, so it, it's what we call uh, a Pareto distribution or it's sometimes called the power law. And it's uh, often mentioned in economics too, that uh, you know, when a small minority of people have all the, uh, the wealth, well, a small minority of cases cause a majority of the other cases, 10 to 20% cause 80 to 90%. And there are certain conditions under which uh, this happens. And some of these are in crowded places where there are lots of people close by so that you have close contact settings and confined or enclosed spaces with poor ventilation. And these are called the three C's and the WHO and many other countries are promoting public information about avoiding the three C's. And if you have all three at the same time, uh, it's so much the worse. However, for some reason in Canada, we're, we're not talking about that so much. Uh, the other thing is the fact that it's airborne. Um, this is a tweet that the WHO put out, basically trying to fight against what they called fake news when people were saying it was airborne. However, in October, uh, they came out with a statement that basically recognized the three C's and also recommended ventilation as a, a way of reducing transmission. And all this confusion reminds me of the story from India about the six blind people trying to figure out the elephant. Each one has a piece of it and they've, they've got their piece pretty well cornered. Um, and they have a, a bit bright, but when you put it all together, they're all wrong. And that, as Andy mentioned, Public Health on um, Public Health Agency of Canada has finally recognized that 
um, the virus does exist in these small particles called aerosols, which linger in the air. And that in settings with poor ventilation, there have been a lot of transmission. And then it mentions the, the three C's that I just talked about. And also it emphasizes drawing as much fresh air as possible from the outdoors into the building where you are. Uh, this just came out Friday and unfortunately, um, Public Health Agency of Canada says one thing, but Public Health Ontario is saying the opposite. Uh, after fighting with these people since last February, <laughs> they just came out with a statement and they're, which basically says there is currently no evidence that COVID-19 is transmitted through air, the airborne route, which is just plain wrong. <laughs> uh, but it gives you an idea about some of the fights we're having. I think this picture proves it to me. Uh, here's a... Uh, the green uh, trajectories are the projectile, the big uh, droplets that are coming out, and the cloud, uh, the, the red um, parts are the aerosols, the small particles. And you can see the big droplets just fall to the ground, but the aerosols, they get picked up by the air currents because they don't have enough weight to fall. So they just get uh, blown around whichever way the wind's blowing. And that also happens in toilets. Uh, here's a, a picture. You can just imagine these MIT scientists with these cameras flushing a toilet. <laughs> but uh, you can see all the particles going off in all directions. And, and beside there, you can see where they land. And you can imagine in a stall, uh, all the contamination that happens. And then the cleaners who have to uh, come in there and clean it all up. So this is a description of the various paths of transmission and uh, the uh, lettering is a little small so I, I'm going to uh, expand it as I, I walk my walk us through it. So first of all we have a, an infected person who is doing a respiratory activity that's a scientific way of saying they're breathing and talking and singing and coughing and sneezing and some large droplets come out the green ones that I showed you, and these secretions can land in somebody else if they're too close. And then somebody else might get it in their eyes, nose, or mouth and become infected. It can also land on their hands, and with their hands, they could touch their eyes, nose, and mouth. But often it would land on a surface, and from a surface, it could go to somebody else's hand who could then uh, also touch a surface and contaminate it or touch another person. And that person again could uh, cause surface contamination. So you can see it going many different ways. Then we have it in the air. We have small aerosols and we have uh, droplets. And the droplets are the ones that are inspired, uh, which means they you inspirate them. You, and then the inhaled aerosols are the ones that go to the bottom of the lung. And it's been shown that these are a little more dangerous than than the ones that land in the upper respiratory system. And then from all these three ways, a person at risk uh, can be infected. Now we also have droplets that land on surfaces that, that float around in the air and then cover surfaces. So uh, it connects with the surface contamination. And there's also consideration about fecal urinary transmission. So uh, washrooms become a very important place to pay attention to. Now we can put masks on the person to try to stop the respiratory activity from spreading. And we can put masks and hand washing and uh, face shields on people who are near those people. And together, if we do all this from both angles, uh, hopefully we'll stop, break these paths of tr transmission. For respiratory activity, again, we have masks uh, to contain but we need different masks if you're if it's in the air and you're inhaling it. And that's when we need the um, N95 or better mask to stop the inhaled particles and the small inspired particles. Plus we need to wash surfaces uh, regularly. Although uh, the latest information is that uh, surfaces aren't uh, probably a major uh, route of transmission for this disease. 
Now, ventilation is an important part of that. And in order to understand that, uh, we need to have a bit of a look at what goes on inside the ventilation system. The green or the blue arrow shows the recirculating air that comes from the building. The green is the fresh air that comes in and it gets mixed and it either gets heated or cooled depending on what's needed. And then it goes through all these pipes into these rooms and then it returns again along the purple route and part of it goes out the relief uh, exhaust and part of it gets recirculated. Uh, that's how it normally works. Exhaust ventilation just goes out and doesn't get uh, recirculated. So if you look in a room, this is where the supply, where the air blows into the room and the return is the egg crate uh, looking uh, flat piece where the air leaves the room. And if you're in a health and safety committee, I advise you to go on the roof and have a look at these units. Uh, sometimes they're not in the roof, they're in the building. And if you go and look at these units, open them up, turn off the power obviously, and look inside. It's amazing what you'll see. All the air you breathe has to pass over this. And here we see a bent um, filter. So it's allowing the air to bypass the filter. You're seeing water damage, rust, uh, probably some mold and the insulation loose. All this picks up and delivers uh, and that's what you're breathing. So on your to-do list, uh, have a look inside your uh, heating, ventilation and air conditioning units. Now there's a lot of talk about air changes and most uh, HVAC systems are designed to turn the air over about five or six times an hour. But that only happens if the setting on the thermostat for the fan is on on. If it's on auto, then the fan only comes on when you need heating or cooling. And that's usually about 20% of the time. So if, if your fan is only running 20% of the time, that's only that much of the time you, you're getting fresh air. And most, uh, most HVAC units only take in about 10 to 25% of outdoor air. Um, the other uh, 75 to 90% is recirculated. So if you have five to six air turnovers, only 10 to 15 or 25% of that is fresh air, then actually you're uh, actual air turnover rate for outdoor air is only 0.5 to 1.5. And this all assumes you have perfect mixing in the room, which is usually not the case. There are often dead spaces. Open windows and doors will give you more exchanges um, and possibly more outdoor air supply if you can open your window. Uh, if you go to 100% outdoor air supply, however, you won't be able to manage the temperature or the humidity in extreme weather conditions. And we'll talk a bit more about that. So another thing to do to put on your to-do list is to make sure your fan setting on your ventilation system control thermostat is on on. Now, people talk about using carbon dioxide as a substitute for calculating air changes and it can be done and here's a trace of it. You can see it goes from 550 parts per million up to uh, 950 by four o'clock in the afternoon and then gradually drops. And from the decay here, we can calculate the air turnovers. So, so this is a way that you can use uh, carbon dioxide. You can also see the pattern in the temperature. However, if you're going to deliver as much outdoor air as you possibly can, it's perfect for when the outdoor air temperature is uh, 10 degrees or 50 degrees Fahrenheit and occupants uh, may expe be experiencing some thermal comfort outside this zone. So in the winter and in the summer when it's hot or when it's really cold, you need to tell people to uh, get used to, uh, you know, thermal discomfort, uh, bring sweaters, blankets, even thin gloves, space heaters, whatever. Uh, opening windows and using barriers like plexiglass dividers may also disrupt designed air flows. Um, and if you want to figure out where the air is going, a simple way of doing that is using a soap bubble gum, gun. I always say gum. <laughs> uh, relative humidity uh, is very difficult to maintain in the Canadian winter. If you're going to look at it, steam injection humi 
humidification systems are probably the best ones, but it, uh, they have to be designed properly and maintained and maintaining these things is quite a job. So another thing to do is to prepare the occupants in your building for some thermal discomfort during the pandemic because we're trying to bring in more outdoor air. Now, relative humidity, um, different um, contaminants in buildings like different um, degrees of uh, humidity. And for viruses, um, the sweet spot where they are least a problem is somewhere between 45% and 70% and relative humidity. However, this is difficult to achieve. Here you can see a winter uh, tracing of carbon dioxide and uh, relative humidity. And what you'll notice, the carbon dioxide is the blue one, the relative humidity is the gray, is that they follow each other. So wherever the carbon dioxide is coming from is where the relative humidity is coming from. And guess where the carbon dioxide is coming from? Exhaled breath. So we're humidifying this space using exhaled breath. And that's probably not a good idea. But you can see that the relative humidity is down below 20%, which is quite common. So another thing on your to-do list is to check into humidification. We have a checklist actually, so you didn't have to write all these down. You can go to our website and, and download this. And for a health and safety committee, it has 26 questions with some guidances and some references about uh, measuring uh, air exchanges, uh, when how to operate the system, adequate washroom supply and exhaust ventilation, what kind of filters, et cetera. Uh, Jeffrey Siegel from the U of T is an indoor air quality expert on filters, and uh, he has quite a bit to say about MERV 13 filters and the others. However, the bottom line that he says that in most situations, filters are may be considerably less effective than other infection control measures, including social distancing, isolation of known cases, and hand washing. And so uh, don't put all your your eggs in one basket. You have to look at the full spectrum of prevention. However, that being said, uh, there is some science that says the, uh, the virus likes to cling to particles. And um, so if you can reduce the number of particles in the air, that will probably be of some benefit. Now there's a lot of people putting um, a lot of money into air purifiers, uh, however, you need to really watch that you look at the clean air delivery rate um, because you need to size them for a room. For instance, in a classroom, you probably need three or four of these to, to adequately cover the whole room. And people don't realize that. They think, oh, I can buy one and throw it in the room. The other thing to note is the noise level. Generally, the background noise level for classrooms should be between 30 to 40 decibels. Uh, for a good learning environment, uh, oops. But you can see that some of these are up at 70 decibels. And so you may buy it, but you only may be able to run it on the low speed and it will give you a lot less uh, cleaning. So in summary, some of the things that need to be done is first of all, remove and control COVID sources, hold off persons with COVID and COVID related symptoms or keeping people working at home. Engineering controls such as ventilating by the HVAC system and uh, also opening windows and doors. Administrative controls, reducing occupancy in indoor places and personal protective behavior, keeping your distance, practicing uh, respiratory etiquette and wearing a, some kind of a mask. And this is all part of the hierarchy of controls, which health and safety know all about. But uh, this is a new lesson for some of the people in the um, inf infection prevention and control. Uh, and here's a nice poster. Uh, it's designed for um, a school, uh, uh, an elementary or a high school. However, it has a lot of the ideas about healthy classrooms, healthy buildings, healthy activities, schedules, and policies. And it comes down to communicating, cleaning, hand washing, ventilating, distancing, screening, and masking. 
and no one thing can do it all. It all has, the, you need all the pieces of the puzzle together. And so uh, here's another thing to add to your tutulua. There are lots of good um, posters online and things like that that you could print up and, and post around. So thank you for your time and attention. Thank you so much, John. Um, I, is, this is especially inf important information considering the fact that many of the campuses that uh, we are, work from um, have older buildings with older ventilation. Um, and, and we this information is really important, especially when asking uh, our administrations uh, and our joint health and safety committees to take action on ventilation. So thank you so much, John. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, so now we're going to go into uh, our breakout rooms uh, for regional discussions about action planning in the post-secondary education sector uh, at the local level, the provincial level, as well as the broader labor movement. Uh, so now I will pass it back over to Chandra Lee, uh, again, to remind folks how to select their breakout rooms. Hi, folks, me again. So just a reminder, I, I need you to uh, let me know which room you're going into. So I'm going to share my screen once again, so we can have a quick review on how to do that. So again, there are five different uh, breakout rooms. The um, first one is the South Southwestern room. The second one is the Northern Ontario room. Then we have Eastern Ontario is room three. Room four is the Greater Toronto Area Room, and room five is Central Ontario. So in order for me to know which room I'm putting you into, I need you to uh, put the number of the room that you're going to be going into in front of your screen name. So to change your screen name, you need to click on the participants button down at the bottom of your screen, and then that will open up the list of participants. You find your name, hover over it, and it'll pop up saying rename. If you click on that, that's where you're gonna put that number in. So if you can put it at the front of your name, not at the back end, if you start off with, uh, for instance, Rebecca is from Central Ontario. She wants to go into room five. So she's gonna change her screen name to say five dash Rebecca. If you could all make sure that you've done that, um, and then I will take a moment or two to uh, put you into your rooms. But before doing that, I just want to make sure that you know which region you're in, because sometimes it can be a little bit confusing. So I'm just going to go over that really quickly. So South Southwestern Ontario covers Hamilton, London, Niagara, Kitchener, Waterloo, Sarnia, Chatham-Kent, Guelph, and Windsor. The Northern Ontario room is a huge district. We've only put a smattering of uh, the cities in the list, but to give you a sense, it's Thunder Bay, North Bay, Sudbury, Sault Ste. Marie, and Kenora, pretty much everything North Perry Sound. The uh, Eastern Ontario region covers Ottawa, Kingston, Belleville, Peterborough, Cornwall. Greater Toronto area covers Toronto, York, Mississauga, Markham, Brampton, Oshawa, Ajax, Milton, and Vaughan. And then Central Ontario covers Barrie, Perry Sound, Owen Sound, Orangeville, Huron, and Grey Bruce. So if everyone can make sure they go ahead and do that, then what I will do is I'm just going to take a moment, uh, go off screen really quick, and then put everybody into your rooms. We have allotted 30 minutes for the rooms. That time can go by very quickly. So um, please, if you can get into discussions right away, that would be fantastic. And I'm just going to go off camera for one sec and make those room changes. And we'll see you all in, a, uh, in those rooms in a few minutes. Thanks. And I'm just going to throw it over to uh, Kayla for to close us off. And then I want to say big shout out to CFS Ontario and OUWCC. Uh, it's been great partnering. This was a great evening. Um, really appreciate us all being together. Kayla. Great. Thanks so much, Janice. Um, I just want to say uh, to everyone, this has been another great session. Um, and thank you all for dedicating uh, your Tuesday night to join us to talk about health and safety uh, during the pandemic as part of our uh, webinar. I just wanted to say thank you to the panelists, to Andy, John, uh, to the interpreters, as well as uh, to the people who chaired uh, the breakout rooms. And thank you so much for sharing your ideas in the breakout rooms. Uh, and, a, and a thank you to uh, all of the staff who 
uh, put the hard work together to run our webinars. Uh, so we're so pleased that you were able to join us for these important conversations tonight and want to say thank you so much again. And we're looking forward to future conversations about health and safety uh, and, and what we can do together on our campuses. So thank you so much, everyone. And I hope you have a great and excellent night and, and, and an even better week. <laughs>